When I was growing up in church, we used to sing this song, a piece of bread would buy a bag of gold. Wish we'd all been ready. And so I went to the store yesterday. I think I got a pound of ground beef, uh, some eggs, uh, some bread, and uh, some crackers. <laughs> $20. $20. Now, most of us who are our generation are shocked by those kinds of prices. What will they be someday for our kids? It's just really hard to comprehend, and how will we, how will we keep up with all this that is going on? Anyway, we need a time of refreshing in the midst of all of that. And let's do that today in Psalm 23. So find Psalm 23 in your Bible. And let's just have a time of thinking about the goodness of God as the Good Shepherd. And we just gave a, gave a good illustration earlier of God being the Good Shepherd. Now regardless of what, th what happens in life and regardless of how things come out at any particular moment in time, God is still... The good shepherd. However, we are extremely thankful for his good shepherding of his sheep here at Westover and his provision for us. We may seem relatively insignificant in the larger kingdom of God, but in God's eyes we're not, are we? I mean, we see an example of this, and we've seen several examples of this, and you are not insignificant in God's eyes. I'm not. None of us are. God cares deeply and profoundly for us. Make a choice to affirm his goodness in your life, regardless of the things that happen in your life, that God is good. Now, the title of the sermon today is The Character of God on Display. Can I say something to you? Sheep are not dumb. Sheep are not dumb. They just need a shepherd, all right? Sheep are not dumb, they just need a shepherd. They need someone to point them to where they need to go and where they need to be and what they need to be doing. We have a very pastoral setting on the road when we're going home that uh, this gentleman who is a, seems like a very kindly man because I've experienced him over the years who has a lot of sheep uh, that are set on a hill and they have a little pond there and he has a couple of sheep dogs and uh, those sheep dogs are there don't worry they're there it's most of the time they're crouched down low in the grass and so when you drive by if you catch them just right they're looking at you well, even when you don't see them they're still looking at you and if you were to go up there and try to do something to those sheep those dogs would rise up and here they would come toward you and they would take care of business. That's what they do. Uh, they guard the sheep. And so this morning we want to talk about the Good Shepherd and we're reading from the 23rd Psalm. Wouldn't you agree that's probably one of the favorites of most folks who don't even know the Bible. They'll say, well, I'm familiar with the 23rd Psalm. Now what I want to do before we get to the 23rd Psalm is read from the New Testament, I'm not even going to tell you where I'm going to read from because I don't want you to look there. I want you to stay right with the 23rd Psalm, uh, and I don't want you to be behind when we get to the 23rd Psalm, but I want to read from a New Testament passage where Jesus spoke of himself as being the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. So here's what Jesus said I am, I am the Good Shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When did he do that? At the cross, right? He who has hired a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. That could be understood as just about anything other than Jesus. The world, the world system, Satan, uh, whenever there's trouble, those things flee away from you that are not there to protect you. But Jesus says he is not the wolf. When the wolf is coming, he leaves this, this hired, hired hand, if you will, leaves his sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. 
He flees because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. Let me say this to you. There's nothing in this world that cares for you like Jesus cares for you. There's no one in this world, as much as you love your spouse, you love your children, you love your grandchildren, there's really no difference between them. Uh, at least I would say that. I mean, you love them, but there is no one in this world who loves you as much as Jesus loves you. And so therefore, I know my sheep, Jesus says. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just that the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So do you hear that, my brothers and my sisters, when you think about this 23rd Psalm? That Jesus himself is indeed the good shepherd. So let's get to the 23rd Psalm. This is the king of Israel, David, who is writing, who is intimately acquainted with God as best he can be under the old covenant. He looks through a glass rather dimly, the Bible says. He's not seen clearly Jesus himself, but he is aware that God is at work and the Holy Spirit is leading him. And therefore, he writes these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What does that mean to say about death? That death at some level is not real. It's not meant to say, though, that we don't die physically. Of course we do. But it's meant to suggest that there is a greater reality than death seems to be. You follow me? I mean, death seems, death's a big deal. I'm not minimizing it. The, the, the psalmist is not minimizing it. But he's saying that compared to the reality of what's to come and the reality of heaven and reality of life after death, the death itself is a mere shadow. We have a kind of a cute little video of our, our grandson at the back of this sanctuary, him chasing his shadow. And uh, he was having a big time with it. I don't know if they still have that video or not. It, it's just $5. But anyway, but anyway, he's running around and he's, he, 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 thinks, he thinks that's something separate from himself, you know. And uh, so the psalmist is saying that this is a shadow. This is not the real thing itself. You understand the difference between you and the shadow. Me and my shadow, right? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows the balm of Gilead. Now, I didn't say B-O-M-B. -B. I said B-A-L-M. The balm of Gilead was an oil that was a healing oil. Easterners understand oil as medicinal. You apply it on the outside. You never get a quart low on the inside. You apply it on the outside. You anoint your head with oil. Your cup runs over. And then he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How about that? From a person who is just seeing shadows, for a person who has not seen the reality of heaven, for a, for a uh, Hebrew scholars, uh, especially liberal ones, will always tell you that the Bible or the Old Testament, that the prophets and the kings and others really had no understanding of life after this life. In other words, they would have thought in some cases this life is all there is. I don't agree with that. Let me be clear on that. But that's what some of the more liberal Hebrew, Hebrew scholars, Jews especially, will say this, that there's no real evidence in Scripture, even though Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and he shall be on the earth again someday. 
And I'm paraphrasing there. But I think David had a more robust understanding of life after this life than perhaps these liberal scholars give him credit for because this notion of I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, what's that sound like? Does that sound like a grave? Not at all, does it? Doesn't sound like a grave at all. Doesn't sound like I occupy this life for how many years I occupy it and then I die and that's the end. Doesn't sound like that. It sounds like I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever is speaking of something that is eternal. So now let me give you five words that begin with the letter P, and I'll let you write these down if you'd like. Five words that begin with the letter P concerning this 23rd Psalm. This is just to help you remember, to kind of help you organize your thoughts. That's the only reason for these. One of them or more might be a little bit forced which they generally tend to be when you're doing something like this. But I can always remember the 23rd Psalm on the basis of these words. And certainly I can remember it to, to quote it most of the time unless I'm having a bad day. So first of all, let me suggest to you with the character of God on display, we are not dumb. We just need a shepherd that he is a personal shepherd. We know that on the basis of this psalm and everything in the New Testament tells us that as well. He called his disciples by name. He knew them before they knew him. And frankly, when it says in Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, that is a rather intimate statement in Scripture because the word know can be understood as a physical union before, between a man and woman. It is a very intimate expression. He is not saying that, but he is saying that I know you intimately. I understand you profoundly. I know more about... Listen, can you understand that God knows more about you than you know about you? That's hard to understand, isn't it? God knows more about you than you know about you. Now, Satan doesn't. But God does. God knows more about you than you know about. First of all, how many of you know when you'll die? Right? How many of you know whether you'll have, excuse me, more grandchildren someday? I almost got choked up. How many of you know uh, what your kids will pursue when they're older? How many of you know all the answers to the, well, we don't know in many cases, right? But God does. So therefore, God knows more about us in our lives than we know about ourselves. This is why you've got to stop micromanaging every event in your life and begin to trust God. Because if you don't, you are exercising control that you don't deserve, nor do you have. Do you follow me? You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But we don't need to because... It's going to lead to a shipwreck, uh, if you will. Now, the Lord, it says, Psalm 23 and verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. Is that an intimate statement? Have you ever heard anybody introduce their husband or their wife, whatever the case may be, this is my husband, this is my wife? Do they say this is a husband? Do they say this is someone's husband? Do they say this is someone? You get the point. They say, no, this is my, this is my son. This is my daughter. You tell your kids sometimes you should if you don't. When you go to school and act like a fool, that brings some heat on my family, on our family, because we're all in this together, right? But yet when you get an award or when you do something good, we see that. That brings something on our family that we really appreciate, right? So therefore, when he says the Lord is my shepherd, it is an intimate expression of his relationship with God. Let me tell you something. David was in caves a lot. He was also running from that lunatic Saul, remember? That's my favorite. I like to call him a lunatic every time. I'm glad he's not living though. That's a big old boy, and you wouldn't want to get in a fight with him. 
unless you were David. David, who knocked out a, who knocked out Goliath, he ain't gonna break a sweat with Saul. He could have taken Saul out a bunch of times, but he didn't do it. Read the story. But I'm just telling you that he learned a lot about himself and a lot about God when he was in those caves and he was going through difficulty. He come out of that going, you know what? There is a God, and He's my God. Amen. <clears throat> It's one thing to say there is a God. It's another thing to say He's mine. By mine, I don't mean I control Him. I mean mine by relationship. He's my God. So it is a statement of intimacy. Look at verse 2. He makes me. You see that? He makes me. Do you see the latter part of verse 2? Where is it? as the people that write Bibles like to say, or interpret, or not interpret, but copy Scripture, will say, part 2B, and I don't mean it's 2B or not 2B, but it's 2B. 2B, what's it say? He leads me. If you don't like the life you're living, maybe he's not leading it. I gotta believe that when he's leading my life, it doesn't mean that I'll have a four-car garage, but I think it does mean that I will have a more joyful life in the midst of everything that occurs in my life. This is the thing you gotta get in your DNA. God did not surrender his son on the cross in order to give you better stuff. He surrendered his son on the cross to save you first and foremost, but secondly, to bring about a joyful change in your life that no matter what's going on, that you can still have joy in the midst of it. You cry your heart out, you feel broken, yeah, but you can still get through that and find joy in it. It's personal. He leads me, even though I, in verse 4, for you are with me. Verse 4. This is personal. None of this deism that God is the cosmic clock winder and therefore he wound the clock, removed himself from history, and then someday he'll come back to it and go, how'd it go for you? None of that. None of that like when you drop, you remember the first time you dropped your kids off at kindergarten? or day school or something, or whatever whatever it might have been, and you, you thought, God, I'd like to go in with them. And then some of us boys could laugh at all the boys that were crying, right? Right? Except I was probably one of them. <laughs> but you understand my point. But this is the God that, you, he, don't, he doesn't drop you off. He goes in with you. I want to tell you something. You're raising kids. You can't go where your kids are going to go. Do you know that? Except when you teach them about God, God goes with them. Amen. Yeah. He'll go, up, he'll go with them on those teenage dates. Remember them. Let's don't talk about them. He'll go with them. You need a personal God. Amen. Personal. He's personal. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. Rabboni, how do you know us? They were astounded that he knew them. He's a personal God. How can God know every name of every person who ever existed? When I can't even remember the names of my grandkids sometimes. I think I called one of my daughter, granddaughters by the other granddaughter's name most of the weekend. Well, God is a personal God. That's the first P word. Jehovah Jireh is what? My provider. My provider. Now, I want to just say maybe one or two more things here. I think we don't take into consideration that the God of creation, the God of universe is, is intimately involved in our lives. It's an astounding thing. Is it not? You may feel alone. David probably felt alone. But he was never alone. 
before the Lord was personal. You know the difference between feelings and facts? They get pretty close together sometimes, don't they? Y'all remember me sharing that story about witnessing to someone years ago, and, and uh, I, I'm telling this story because it, I think it fits here, is they were one of these people that really didn't believe there was any objective truth. And by that they meant that truth is just what you think it is. That it's not objective or beyond us. And I said, well, is the sun shining or not? And you remember, he said, I ain't got time for that. You see what I'm saying? Objective truth is the sun shining or not. It would, can we agree that we can all come to the same conclusion on whether the sun is shining or not? Based upon the facts and not our feelings? He's personal. Paul said his, his peace, which is the second word, passes all understanding. That's all right. They're just trying to compete with me. These kids, they can't compete with me. No. Thank God for them. I used to do that too. So you can't do it. That's not strong enough. <laughs> All right. The second word is peace. Peace. Look at the pastoral language here. And by pastoral, we're talking about shepherdly language. Let me ask you this question. Where would you rather be in a green meadow or in the desert? Because in the green meadow, there's life. Where do the sheep like to hang out? They like the green meadow. They like that clover. Did y'all see this ridiculous video of this man that I think it's, you can YouTube it? And he decided to be a sheep, I think, or a goat. And so he had goat things made for him. Did y'all see that? Did y'all see that? I don't watch many videos like that. But he got out there and ate, ate with them and lived with them for a while. He became one of them. Well, where did they go? Did they go to the desert? No. They went. I know that's crazy. I shouldn't have even introduced it. But the meadow. The, meadow, the luscious meadow. Look. He leads me to where green pastures. He doesn't take me to Jordan. <laughs> I hope this doesn't go over there. He doesn't lead me there. He leads me. Listen, Israel, when I was in Israel, I was astounded by these really large areas in Israel where they are seeking to be as self-sufficient as they can be because they have this netting, which we would think of as this this netting that obscures tanks, camouflages tanks, and other kinds of uh, material to keep the enemy from seeing it when they fly over. They have, they have netted large, large, large areas of their, of their country. And under that, the sun can kind of get through, but can't get too through where it burns up the crops. And underneath that, they're growing everything. Watermelons, some of the best stuff. He leads me into green pastures. And look at this latter part of verse 2, or 2b. He leads me beside what kind of waters? Still. Still waters. Peaceful. Peaceful. God does not lead you to some of the places you go. Now, by that, I do not mean that he doesn't lead you into storms. He does. But he gives you peace. In the midst of those. Amen. That's what I'm saying. You see, still waters doesn't mean that there'll be ne never be any storms. But it really means in the midst of all of that, you still can have peace. Amen. Look at verse 5. I'm going to get to that in a moment, but I just want to point that out here. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You see that? How many of you like a buffet? You like Chinese food? Maybe Mexican? A little Los Portales? Go to China, China buffet, something. Yeah? I stepped out of my comfort zone last night and went to Taco Bell. It was 
pretty radical. I said, look, they don't have much on this menu. But anyway, having said that, look what it says. You prepare a table, a buffet before me in the presence of my enemies. Wouldn't you rather him take you out of your enemies? Of course you would. I would too. But he says in the midst of that, here's your buffet. I've come to give you myself, not the absence of conflict or the absence <coughs> of peace. In this world, you shall have tribulation. Number three, provision. The first one was he's a personal God, my shepherd. The second one is peace in the midst of all these things. Third is provision. Provision. It says in this passage that we just read that God provides for his people. In fact, in verse 5, it says, My cup overflows. I don't think I can prove this, but I feel like coffee is more liquid than water. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do a PhD level research project on this. Because I've noticed that if I have water, it never spills. But coffee always spills. I think it's more liquid. Some of you think you're out of your head. But you already knew that. Anyway, yes, thank you. Provision. Here David is not just talking about the material. Though God does care about the material. And I will tell you this. If you think God just cares about the material. Then your God is a glorified Santa Claus. He's more than that. He's more than that. Oh, I talk to God when I need something. That's right. I know. But that's not God. Now, I'm not saying you don't ask God, but I'm just saying that a relationship that's, that David is talking about here is not just a relationship when I need something. Any of you married? Any of you been married? How about the spouse that only calls your name when they need something? You like it? Love that. What do they say? Hey, honey, sweet cakes. Would you bring me another glass of tea? You love that? You love it just when they ask you for something, they call you? Not really. That's really not a relationship. That's a servant. Some people get married because they want servants. That's not serve. That's not Christ in us. He says, the Lord is my provision. Provision. I shall not want because he provides for me. And by that, again, not the material... You know why I don't want? Do you know? It begins with the letter R. Relationship. Oh, sure. I can see somebody with a nicer car or this or that. And then maybe a thought will come into my head. But why do I not want? Why does David not want? Because he's king? No. There's story after story of kings who always wanted. Saul was one of those maniacs. He always wanted. He wanted David to be dead. Remember when he didn't need David to be dead because David loved him. He loved his son Jonathan. So, I am content because of Christ in me. Whether he gives me an Opal GT, none of you remember that. Mercury Comet. VW. Bug. And I'll tell you, the, the, the gross materialism that we live in in our country today has created a lot of uneasiness and dissatisfaction. Listen, you don't know how poor you are until you watch TV and they tell you. Because you might think you're rich. 
I just have to point to past generations who had less and seem to be more content than we are. Is that fair? I think it's I think it's accurate. We probably have more and are less content than any generation that's ever lived. Number four. So I gave you personal peace. The second one was peace. The third one's provision. And the fourth one is protection. Protection. Your soul will go to heaven if you're in Christ. And there's nothing this world can do to take that away from you. Not one thing. Nothing. 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 If I die in a plane crash, it just means I get to heaven. I'm already close. If you're flying with allegiance, you're not that close. But anyway, I'm just saying that protection, David speaks of it. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, which is both uh, uh, encouragement and correction. That's what the rod is for. It's not simply to be seen as encouragement in the sense of absence of any sort of difficulty, but the rod was seen as a way of correcting me, correcting my behavior, keeping me from engaging in dangerous acts that would damage me and others. And that's what David is speaking of. You know, David could have taken Saul's life several times, and I'm sure everybody around him said, you need to do it. He, he's, he's no good. David wouldn't do it. I believe David felt like the Lord would protect him, don't you? I do. And so let me give you the, the fifth one. So we've got personal peace, provision, protection, and let me give you the fifth one. And I, I kind of tortured this into a word, but don't worry, I've seen some great preachers do it, so... I can get away with it. Uh, the word possibility. Possibility. Which might be another word for hope. If you look at verse 6, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's he say? Where I'm at is not where I'll always be. That's what he says. Which is another way of saying you have a hope. Mark chapter 2 has the story of the paralytic who's low. You remember the story where he's lowered down through the roof? The late Harold T. Bryson, who was professor at New Orleans Seminary, had a wonderful sermon on that in Mark chapter 2. And it was titled this, You Could Be a Paralytic and Have a Hope. Isn't that good? You could be a paralytic and have a hope. You could be a little child dying of leukemia and have a hope. You stand next to the grave of someone you love and miss and still have hope. You can go and hear the word cancer and still have hope. Mm -hmm. You can go and hear bad news <coughs> about your building and the damage it's incurred and still have hope. And I think that's what David's saying. It is the possibility of God in our lives. Wouldn't you agree? So personal peace, provision, protection, and possibility. And news at 10. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the leadership of the Holy Spirit in David's life so that he can share this word with us. We thank you, Lord, that you're the good shepherd and the relationship comes through Jesus as we trust in you and repent of our sins. It is by faith that you become the good shepherd in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name.